Uh, grab your Bibles, if you would, and turn them. I'm going to use two scriptures this morning. Uh, you know that we're doing a series on the subject of spiritual cowardice. It kind of sounds like a heavy subject, and it's not really what it sounds like. Um, so Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, and then put a, a, a marker there, and we're also going to go into the great story of David and Goliath in verse 17. Um, so if you could uh, kind of get ready in both of those places. So, 1 Samuel chapter, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. I'll start with verse 7. But he who overcomes shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Um, I want to just stop right there. The Lord really doesn't ask us to overcome anything, but asks us to identify by faith with Christ who has already overcome all things. And it is that faith and that identity is how we overcome. But for the cowardly, receive. But for the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderer and the immoral person and the sorcerer and idolaters and all liars will have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And that is not encouraging our flesh to church this morning. <laughs> and that's not that's not where we're going. Turn your Bibles over if you, if you over to First Samuel 17, if you would. I want to minister on the subject. This is the third. Uh, message I've done in this series on spiritual cowardice, and I want to subtitle it, The Importance of a Victory. Enduring warfare is one of the hardest parts of being a believer. Uh, the problem with warfare is you can teach about warfare, you can teach some principles about warfare, but the problem is that you cannot reproduce what warfare is going to feel like in a person's life. You can't, uh, you can't tell a person how it's going to come into their life, what it's going to look like, the, the circumstances through which it's going to come. You can't tell anybody that. You can just give them points and perspectives and, and experiences how you got through warfare. I look back over my life and my relationship with the Lord, and I look at times that seem as though there was no way out. Can I get the back doors of the sanctuary closed, guys? Thank you. And, uh, and, and, and so we want to minister on that. You never know when there's going to be a victory that's going to happen in your life that's going to change your whole life. And David walked away from the battle with Goliath. He walked away a different person. And I think about this a lot because uh, as with anybody that walks with the Lord, and especially if you're attempting to do something for God and accomplish something for God, you try to follow the will of God for your life, the destiny of God for your life, you're going to encounter some stuff. You're, you're definitely going to encounter some stuff. And, and so that's what we want to minister on. The, let me just say this before I pray. Spiritual cowardice, we all can understand cowardice in, in some way. You know, we're all scared of different things. Different things intimidate different people. But spiritual cowardice drapes itself. This is why it is so hard to see. Spiritual cowardice disguises itself in common sense. It disguises itself on what is natural. It will work on what the nat what, what it would the decision making that would flow from the natural where naturally this makes sense, but it's not God. Listen, to follow the will of God, to follow the command of God sooner or later is going to rub up against your natural thought process. It's going to rub up against what you naturally think you should do. You're going to come against those things probably all the time in one way or another. And so I'm going to pray. Father, we just come before you this morning. We ask in the name of Jesus that you would anoint this word this morning. Help me this morning, Lord God, to be obedient to you. Help me to feed your people this morning. Lord, we take authority over anything and everything that would harm or hinder the working of your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, there's four victories that I believe, there's probably more than this, but there's at least four victories, different kinds of victories that you're going to have to win in your life as a believer. Number one, they're all, uh, they're all to me, ensconced in the story of King David. Number one, there's the private victories. There's the unseen battles that nobody knows about but you and God. In fact, if you lost them, nobody would really know whether you lost them or not. David, when he came to fight Goliath, said, I have overcome a bear and a lion. Both of those battles were private. They were hidden. There was nobody cheering. There was nobody to impress. 
He was watching what belonged. He was, he was being careful about what belonged to the Father. His, his only reason, now the Bible says that David grabbed a lion by the beard, it means by the mane, and he pulled a sheep out of a lion's mouth. Now to me, when you get a sheep in a lion's mouth, it's over. In fact, there's other sheep to me. You know, it's like, I got a couple hundred of that. I'll let that sheep go. But I'm going to tell you something. When God chooses somebody to lead his people, Amen. when God chooses somebody to lay his hand on, God chooses somebody that in the private places of their life, guard what belongs to the Father. Amen. They guard what, listen, whatever God's going to do in your life, in the outward, in front of people, is always secondary to what God sees you respond to in the private places of your life. Brothers and sisters, for every victory you win in front of people, there's probably been five that you've won that are private. Nobody knew about them. Listen, God uses people that cannot abide things in their private life that they know are going to stand in the way of the destiny of God. Amen. Remember something. That Satan will fight you getting saved. But he doesn't fight you getting saved half as hard as he fights you walking in the destiny of God. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, listen to this. If you at some point do not start pursuing the destiny of God, you will get bored with Christianity. Yeah. It will bore you. It will become going to church and going home and going to church and going home and going to... I, I don't know. You know, I, I, don't, I want to be careful about how I say this. But I've never lived that way. From the moment that I got serious with God on April the 15th of 1988, when I really submitted my life to the Lord, from that moment until now, I've pursued the destiny of God. And I'm, I'm amazed in, in, all of the, in all of the years that I've lived for the Lord, in all of the years we've pastored people, I would say less than 10%, far less than 10% of people, begin to give themselves to the destiny of God for their life. Yeah. And there's different reasons for that. Some people feel incapable. Some people feel intimidated. I was with a man yesterday. I had coffee with him. And when he got through telling me the, the ways God has used him, and he wasn't bragging about himself. He was just sharing his story. When he got through telling me about the way God had used him, the things that God had used him to build, uh, in, 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 in South Africa, I said to him, I said, well, I said, I'm intimidated. And he started laughing. He said, Pastor, I didn't mean that. I said, no, you didn't mean that. And, and sometimes we can get intimidated thinking, I don't know how to do, I don't know how to walk in the destiny of God. When I preached on prayer last Sunday morning, and I, and I walk away thinking, I know there's people thinking, but Pastor, I don't know how to pray. I didn't know how to pray either. You know how I learned to pray? I learned to pray by praying. Amen. I learned to pray by crying out to God and saying, if you don't do something, I'm done. If you don't do something, my life is done the way it is. I've got to have something from God. Listen, I don't, Jesus does not care how many these and vows that you have in your prayer. He doesn't care about formula. He cares about your heart. Amen. The only way to learn to pray is to pray. The only way to begin to fulfill the... I don't care if you're 8 or 80. God grabbed a hold of Daniel at 80 years old and said, I have a mission for this season of your life. Brothers and sisters, listen, this life is fleeting. I'm 48 years old, and it seems like yesterday I was 18. I mean, it really does. I used to hear my dad say stuff like that and think, oh, dad, you're just old. But it's the truth. I was with, uh, Noreen was showing me her yearbook from, where is Noreen? Noreen, are you in this room? There you are. Uh, Noreen was showing me her yearbook from, uh, graduated from Orville. She graduated in 1979. I'm sorry, that made it reveal how old you were. Sorry, I should have said 1999. <laughs> anyway, and uh, we were looking at pictures. Dennis's picture was in that yearbook. And, uh, and we were commenting how fast time goes by. Seems like yesterday. Life is but a vapor. I'm going to tell you something. I don't know what God has. And by the way, I want to say something very clearly. Um, I know I preached on transition about a month ago. Cindy and I have no plans. 
So rest your tired little head. You know, we don't have any plans to go anywhere. So if you're excited that we were, I'm disappointing you. <laughs> um, but we are making plans uh, that if God should call us on something, that this house is set in order. Yeah. That there's a plan in place because sheep get upset when they don't have a shepherd yeah. and they don't know what a shepherd is doing. Right. And so we felt, especially after I've been in prayer, I didn't know what Pastor Frank was going to minister on, what he was going to say, anything that was going to happen at that conference. All I know is that he began to deal with me about a month and a half ago about setting this house in order in case Cindy and I were in transition. And, uh, and then we went to conference, and that was what was being taught on and preached on and, and uh, thought about. And so we want you to know something that, that we take. Listen, I, I was down at Deep Bay the other day, and, and I was... I uh, spent time with the Lord, and, and a, a man that has been greatly used of God came there down in the Bay while I was there. And he's in his latter years, and 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 I think he he didn't exit at the right time, and and has taken a toll on what he built. And I was watching him, and I was thinking about all of this, and I was thinking to myself, I'm not going to be. There. I'm not going to stay beyond. This house has never belonged to us. And when I say us, I mean City and I. Bruce House doesn't belong to us. Timothy House, radio station, that, that's all. That belongs to the Lord. And whenever God is done with us here, those things God gave us, we didn't deserve them. Jesus said, whatever you have been given, you were given freely, so give them away freely. Yeah, that's right. and, and you hold on to things in the kingdom loosely because they don't belong to you to begin with. But I'm going to tell you something. I am... I am not interested in staying longer than doing anything God has called me to do longer than what God has called me to do it. And we want to be, Cindy and I have strived to be people that produce things in our lifeline, or our, excuse me, our lifetime, and not on our lifeline. Is that right? No, no backward. backward. In our lifeline and not in our lifetime. That's right. Okay. Thank you, honey. I don't know where I would be without you. I know. I know. <laughs> I should have never said that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So number one, you have victories that are private. They're the unseen victories. They're the victories that, that nobody, nobody was there. Too, too often today, Christianity, and you may not know this because you're not on my side of it, but too often modern American Christianity is a show. It's a, it's, it's, it's performance. It's all about what people see. It's all about whether I can be a success in the eyes of people. But I'm going to tell you something. What God pays attention to is what you do and what you're fighting for and what you refuse to yield to, what you refuse to surrender to in the private places of your life. That's what God... Listen, brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something. When you're, David did not kill that lion by himself. When, you're, when you are fighting war in the private places of your life... And private victories matter to you. The power of the Holy Ghost is going to get involved in your battle. I'm going to tell you something. God cares about this stuff. God cares about people that are not, you know, it's, it's, I was having somebody tell me the other day about a situation. They said that when this person was confronted, they said, well, I guess I didn't think about it because nobody, nobody saw me. And the person I was talking about it said, where was the idea that God saw me? American culture is getting to be all about what people see. The first victories that are important, the first victories are the private ones. They're the most important. Amen. The greatest victories you ever win, hear this church, hear this in your spirit. The greatest victories you ever win are the victories over yourself. That's right. Remember that. Because wherever there is warfare and battles and bad decisions and bad relationships and a bad way of life and, and, and cat cataclysmic problems, in one way or another, most of the time, in some way, they're the fruit of what was in us. The greatest victories, I, I've come to, I was, tell, I was asking the Lord last night, I was telling my wife this, that our church, there's been some major warfare. If you were here last Sunday, and as much as I am concerned, that was one of the most genuine movings of the Spirit last Sunday that I have been in in a long time. And there was a message in tongues, two messages in tongues, and two interpretations that came forth. And the one 
that the Lord gave through me and that God gave one through Kim. But this is what the Lord said. There has been much suffering in this house. And there has been. There has been much suffering in this place in the last six months. And I was taking this to the Lord last night and I said, Lord, can't there ever come a time when the storm cease? And the Lord said to me, how many know that if you've got something that doesn't seem right between you and God, he's not wrong. You know, you're never going to go to the Lord and the Lord's going to say, hey, I am sorry. I, I, I messed this thing up. You know, that's never going to happen. And so I went, I went to the Lord last night and I said, Lord, can't there ever be just a, a place that you get to where it's, just, where it's just serene? It's just calm water for as far as the eye can see. And the Lord said, Randy, it's always that way. Your battle is not that there's storms. Your battle is that you've not learned to sleep through them. When you sleep in a storm, you can have storm after storm after storm after storm after storm. But the storm's out here. It's not in here. The problem is, is that we want to wait to be peaceful in here until it's peaceful out here. When I'll tell you something, the great thing about the peace of God is, listen, the only reason Jesus could say to a storm, be still. And by the way, here's what, here's what the disciples heard. They heard, be still. But here's what the storm heard. The storm heard, be still. The only way you can speak to a storm is when you have first slept through the storm. And then when what comes out of you is the peace of God. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something. God, God can, can, can empower us to sleep through things that are raging around us. Number two, victories. The second victories are victories, those that, victories for those that follow us. There are people that follow you that need you to win. The Bible says about Joshua, God told Joshua, Joshua, be of good courage because if you win, my people win. You need to understand something. Christianity is a team thing. There are always, there's two sets of people that are attached to you in your warfare. People that follow you, there are other leaders, there's people, other Christians, and then there's your family. Brothers and sisters, listen, you, you've got to understand that your winning or losing the battle you're in right now is not just about you. You're not the only one that will either rise and fall with what you're struggling with. There's people connected to you that will rise and fall with you. A leader, listen, people can't go where a leader doesn't go. A family only goes where the leadership of that family goes. And listen, brothers and sisters, remember something. You're not warring alone. I'm not trying to lay this huge thing on your shoulder. You're not warring alone. God is warring with you. But I, I remember Jensen Franklin years ago when he was preaching, and he said, you know, I'm concerned about this generation of preachers. He said, they all want the big church. They all want the big ministry. They all want something already established. And he said, what I'm concerned about is where is the fight? Amen. Where is the war? Listen, there was, the city and I came to nothing. We had, I was telling Dallas yesterday, I said, when we took our church, we had 20 people, and there were 20 people, but half of them didn't like the other half. <laughs> We, we weren't given anything. We live in a culture that wants to be given everything. I love what, I love what, uh, what what's the, um, the old cowboy actor guy they had to speak at the Republican convention last year? Kim, you're supposed to know these things. <laughs> what? Clint Eastwood, yes. Clint Eastwood, they, they asked Clint Eastwood. They said, uh, what's your opinion of... American life. He said, my opinion is, nobody's going to give you anything. Get off your lazy butt and go earn it. <laughs> no, why a lot of people don't like Clint Eastwood. Yeah. They ask, uh, what's the karate guy? Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris, you know, we're all hearing about this transgender bathroom stuff. <laughs> Ridiculous. Ridiculous. The fruit of a broken culture. That's right. One in 300 people in America is transgender. One in 300. One in 300 is transgender. 
You can have a bathroom set aside for just them. But that's not enough. They want men, grown men, that today feel like a woman in a man's body to be able to go into a little girl's bathroom with your eight-year-old daughter. It's insane. It's insanity. It's the fruit of a broken culture. And I, and I love what Clint Eastwood, or not, who, 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 Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris said, I used to be a man trapped in a woman's body, and then my mother gave birth to me. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, that's not incompassionate. That's not, the, the, the American life could be summed up in this. Sexual brokenness. That's right. Sexual brokenness. Those battles are real. They are absolutely real. I've told you this several times. My family on my father's side has incredible sexual brokenness. But I'll tell you something, there's healing for that in Jesus. There's absolute healing. I was, you know, there was an article put out by a professor at Yale University. And he is not a believer. And he did a study, and his study was whether or not homosexuals can change. And he started the study believing that they were born that way and they could not. And he did a study, and 68% of the people in his study that he did changed. It shocked him. He wrote a book on it. Now I'm going to tell you something. What's been shoved on this culture is that, is that these things, God can change anything. I don't care what you're born with. I don't care what, I don't care what warfare that has plagued your mind and spirit since you entered the world. God can change, He can change anybody. Anybody. Brothers and sisters, listen. The third victory is the victory that people need that are you, our families. See, my war, whether or not I win, directly affects my life. It, it affects my children. It doesn't just affect this church, it affects my family. God wants us to win because He wants us to lead our families into victorious places. And the last victory, this is the victory I really want to get to this morning. There are victories that make you believe in who you are. Amen. This is where I want to go. There are victories that make you believe in who you are in Christ. You will accomplish little if at some point in your Christian life you do not begin to believe that you hear the voice of God, that you know the voice of God, that you know the direction of God, that you're able to operate and function in the anointing of God. See, it's something altogether different to believe that somebody else can. But God wants you to believe you can. Brothers and sisters, there's something birthed in every young man and every young woman that has this, this, this air of greatness. That you believe that you can be great. That you believe God has something great for you in your lifetime. You want to know why? Because God places that in everybody. Amen. And then fears come and insecurity comes and self-doubt comes. And, and, and Satan is so good at, at, in your mind, pinpointing every little shortcoming. And all of a sudden, you, you, you begin to lose hope that you can do and you can accomplish great things in your life. Listen, David was never the same after this war. You want to know why? Because David came away from this understanding that God could use David. I, I don't know. Um, let me just say this. Victories, th these are the three things Satan's going to attack in you. The, the, if you look at this story... The essence of the attack was against David. It was to make David question whether or not David heard God, whether or not David was a man of God, whether or not David could accomplish anything for God. When you begin to step into a life that you want to fulfill the destiny of the Lord, I'm telling you something, Satan will war against you. I mean, he'll war in here. There's three things Satan attacked. Number one, Satan attacked his weapons. He said, you cannot win with a sling and a stone. Yeah. Satan will attack. Everybody's, everybody's got different weapons. Listen, my weapons that I use in the kingdom, I'm not a musician. I can sing a little bit, but I'm not really a... Uh, those are not my weapons. My, my weapons really are not even my intellect 
or even my, my, my preaching. My, I, I would consider my greatest weapon, I love people. I love to talk to people. I love to hear people's story. I love to sit down with people. I, in, I thoroughly enjoy people. Listen, your, Satan will try to attack whatever weapon God put in your hand to use in the kingdom. I don't care what it is, whether it's personality, whether it's, uh, you know, some people, what I have found in this to me is really weird, is that some people, almost how you know what your weapon is, is the thing that Satan fights the most. Amen. I mean, there's people that they're, they're a musician and yet they're scared to death to play an instrument. They're a singer, they're scared, they, they war with singing. They're a teacher or a preacher, they war with getting up in front of people. Use what you have. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you, I believe this with all my heart. I, 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 I'm so, I believe this in the very gut of my soul. If you will use what you have, if you will just bring to God what you have, you're, you're not like somebody else. You don't preach like somebody else. You don't teach like somebody else. You don't sing like somebody else. But bring to the Lord what God can blow on what you bring Him. And God can do amazing things with your life. Yeah. Absolutely, positively amazing things. You look at every great man or woman God's using. Not one of them had a silver spoon. Not one of them had everything going right. Now, most of them fought through one thing after another, after another, after another, but they never quit. Amen. They never quit. Amen. Satan will fight your weapons. Number two, Satan will fight your ways. They looked at David and he was a shepherd. David wasn't a warrior, he was a shepherd. Satan will fight the way God uses you. Nobody, no two people are used the same way. In fact, if you try to be somebody else, it won't work. Have you ever listened to somebody that was trying to be somebody else? And you just go, they're trying to be somebody else. Listen, your way is not my way. Your way actually is not anybody else's way. But if you give it to the Lord, God will use it. I'm amazed, I'm amazed how God can use different personalities. This, this always comes to my mind. There's this lady, Alicia Brickshoulder. And Cindy uses her curriculum at Ruth's house. And she is the most quiet. I mean, she is the most quiet lady. Uh, and, and, but I'm telling you, there is an anointing yeah. on that lady's life. It's amazing. It is amazing. It is amazing. Yeah. She has an amazing anointing. In fact, when I look at one of the most broken, scary places I've ever had, I would ask Cindy if I could borrow her CDs and her DVDs and I would listen to them. Because, I, I mean, just the calmness and the quietness over her spirit. You know who reminds me, or she reminds me of, who reminds me of her? Sarah. I think Sarah has much the same anointing as Alicia Brishon. Listen, if you'll just bring to the Lord what you have, Satan will war with your weapons, your ways, and number three, your word. Satan will fight the word God has given you more than he'll fight anything. Because in the end, what you war with is a word. I was sitting with a man yesterday who was the same man that we were having coffee with. And he's got a business idea that I personally think is the Lord. And, and I, I told him this. I said, we had a word given to us by God in 1997 that said someday Orville will not be known for the production of apples, but for the propagation of the gospel. And this man uh, used to be a missionary in Africa. And in Africa, there's rolling blackouts. Their electrical system, uh, their, their power grid is, is incredibly unstable. And what, they, and what many people in Africa did is they built these bio, uh, bio uh, electrical generators. This man knows another man in Africa that it probably has one that is beyond anything anybody else has been able to put together. It, it can run on it can run on old tires, garbage, plants, wood. It can run, run almost on anything. And he was talking to me about it. And, and, I, and, and I, I could be wrong, I, I'm just human, but I believe that this may be a fulfillment to a, a word from the Lord. He, he has a vision to produce them here in Orville. And, uh, and, and so 
I really, I'm really excited about it. I've been really praying for him, praying for this. But I'm going to tell you something. God will war, or Satan will war with the Word. Yeah. When you have received the Word from God, that thing is the most important thing God could ever sow into your life. Everything God builds, He builds on a Word, a promise He's given you. And Satan will war against that. Now, let me, let me just try to finish this. When David walked away from this battle, he walked away with the knowledge of something. He walked away. I, I personally believe that this is one of the most important truths that David that changed David's life. David did not just walk away with a victory over Goliath who represented Satan. He walked away understanding Satan's tactics. This is very important. He understand, he walked away understanding how Satan, all the time, not most of the time, all the time. This is all the time, 100% of the time, this is how Satan attacks the believer. Voices. Yeah. Always voices. The Bible says that every morning Goliath would come and he would threaten the children of Israel and taunt them. And every evening he would come and threaten and taunt the children of Israel. Interestingly enough, he came at the exact time of the morning sacrifice and the exact time of the evening sacrifice. Both times when, when, when in the temple they would be offering the sacrifices in order to bring peace to the people of God. This giant of the enemy would come to bring fear and torment to the people of God. Remember something. Satan always 100% of the time attacks your life with voices. Always. He doesn't need a new tactic because this one works extremely well. Let's talk about where voices come from. Number one, they come from Goliath, the enemy's voice. The enemy's voice will always taunt you. The enemy's voice will always try to make you self-aware. Self-awareness in life is absolutely the road to misery. Satan will make you aware of every problem, every flaw in yourself. Satan, listen, most of the battles in us as a human being, I, what, I should say this, what, what freedom is, is when you're finally free from focus all the time on yourself. Your circumstances, your fears, your shortcomings, all of those things. Goliath called David names. Goliath uh, made fun of him for being what he looked. He made fun of what he looked like. He made fun of his weapons. He made fun of his abilities. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. Satan is absolutely brutal in your mind. How many know that? How many have I mean, it's all over the place. People being attacked what they look like. People being attacked because of what they can't do. I mean, the, the onslaught of the enemy, when you... When you look at our culture, you look into the faces of people over and over and over and over. You're seeing the elevation of voices. Number two, there were number number one, there was Goliath's voice. Number two, his father, his father's voice. Now it's not said here, but about a year beforehand, when Samuel came to see if there was a God had sent him to David's home and said, There's a king in those boys. His father did not think enough of him to call him out of the field. How many young men and women, we need to remember this. When you have a young man or a young woman that's broken, when you have a young man or a young woman in this culture that's angry and seems rebellious and seems like they don't care, you remember something. You try to remember and try to think about what kind of home they may have come out of. The kind of circumstances they've dealt with their entire life. I have two little boys that walk by my house every day. And I was pulled out of the driveway the other day, and they're probably 10 and maybe 6. And I was pulled out of my driveway the other day to go somewhere, and they were walking by the house, and I happened to look, and I kept, caught this little boy, the 6-year-old's face, he was about eye level to my, to, my, to my door. And I looked in the face of a little boy, he had a can of pop in his hand, and I looked in the face of an angry little boy. I thought, holy cow, does he have an angry look on his face for being 6, maybe 7 years old. But I'll tell you something, what I know, what Cindy knows, what a lot of us know when you're dealing with families, is there is untold pain in American families. Remember something, David brought, David came here having not been thought enough of by his dad to even call him out of the field. Number three, his brothers. His brothers said to him, you are not able. These voices can come from family, they can come from friends, they can come from nobody but in your own head. The, the, old, the old saying that we all know about, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's actually the other way around. Yeah, it is. Words are far more painful yeah. 
they're lasting. Satan can remind you of something that was said to you that was of the enemy to break you down. He can remind you, if you're not careful, he can remind you of it years later. Leaders, this is huge. David's own leadership said, you are not able to do this. You are not able to do this. It was an attack against who David was. And then the last one, internal voices. What I hear on the inside. Let me just give you three examples of men that were destroyed by voices that came from the inside of their heart. Jeroboam. Jeroboam took over the kingdom. God gave him ten tribes of the twelve tribes that Solomon had. God was judging the nation. He took away ten. And he told Jeroboam, he said, as long as you're obedient to me, you'll keep these ten tribes. And the Bible says this. The Bible, this, is so, this is so amazing to me. The Bible says that what destroyed Jer Jeroboam's life is one day a little voice entered his head. And this voice, and this is what the Bible says, a voice entered his head and said to him, if you let the people of God continue to go to Israel or to go to Jerusalem to worship, they're going to turn away from you. And when they turn away from you, they're going to see you as a rebel king and they're going to kill you. None of that was true. God had promised him the kingdom. God had promised him that he would establish his kingdom for four generations if he would just trust him. And one voice undoes all of that and he reacts in fear. And so he builds a pseudo temple in Israel, in the nation he received. And they started calf worship and they started Baal worship. And that's what ended up being his undoing. David, the Bible says that David has a voice enter his head one day that says, one day I'm going to die at the hands of Saul. And for 16 months he runs out of the will of God. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something. Voices are real. They are incredibly real. Many of you sitting in this house today, you are plagued by fears and by lies. And I'll tell you something, if you don't understand them for what they are, Satan will control your life with those things. But Jesus has defeated them. Listen, i got to close. The last, the, the, I want to tell you about something, about another thing David learned. David learned that Satan will always try to get you across the bloodline. Give me about, give me about, Give me seven minutes and 21 seconds. <laughs> the Bible says in this, uh, Joseph Prince is teaching on this. We've been listening to it in small groups. He said that the, the valley, the, the Israelites were on one side of the valley and the Philistines were on the other. And the valley in between was a place called Respius Dalman. And what it means is the bloodline. And what Goliath was trying to do was taunt the children of Israel to fight him in themselves. You see, King David is a type of Christ who has already fought the battle for us and won and we're to let him do that. And we rest in faith. But what Satan will try to get you to do is to war with him in yourself, to cross over into warring in yourself. Why? Because you'll lose. You'll lose every time. And when you war against him, and then, you'll, then you'll, these voices will begin to uh, snowball in your life. And I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. Jesus has already won. Listen. The, the, we've got to wait for the heavenly David, who is Jesus Christ, who finally came out and warred against Goliath. And the Bible says David ended up taking his head off. He ended up defeating the voices of the enemy. Let me just, let me just uh, share this with you, five things that this victory brought in David's life. Number one, David always knew from this point on he knew the voice of God. Number two, his baggage was left forever. The Bible says early on that David left his baggage in verse 22 of chapter 17. David left his baggage with the baggage keeper. How many know everybody has baggage? Oh yeah. Now, it's not like some people do and some people don't. Everybody does. But David left his baggage with the Holy Spirit, right. who was the baggage keeper. Number three, his voices were defeated. Number four, David was an encouragement for everybody else. When David began to chase Goliath, so did everybody else. In Psalm 71, 7, it says this. David said of himself, I am a miracle to many. God wants to use your life for other people to look at and say, if they can make it, I can make it. If they can, if they can walk through that, I can walk through that. I don't know about you, I want to be an example. I don't want to be an example necessarily of, of the stainless steel never make a mistake. I do want to be an example of a survivor. I endured, I survived. Because most people, most people are not going to make it through without some dings in their arm. Number five, he knew the devil's tactics. Number, number six, I like this. David was confident 
in future victories. He was confident that there would be future victories. The Bible says he took the head of Goliath. He went to Jerusalem, which at that time was not a city that the Jews occupied, an enemy army occupied it. And the Bible says he took Goliath's head and he threw it over the wall. And it was in effect saying, you're next. I'm coming for you next. I'm going to tell you something. The people of God are to be chasing the devil, yeah. not the other way around. Amen? Yeah. Stand with me, stand. <coughs> Father, I just come before you this morning, and I just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would rest upon this place this morning. I ask you this morning, Father, that, Lord, you would take whatever's been said this morning, whatever words have been said this morning, I pray that you would work them into people's lives and, the, and the, the battles they face, the warfare they face. Lord God, there's going to be temptation to run. There'll be a temptation to do something other than stand, do something other than fight. Running seems to always be the enemy's answer. I don't know what people are facing, don't know what people are going through, but I know this, that your word has said stand. You've done all you can to do. Stand. And Father, I believe that. I've, I've, Cindy and I have lived that. We've experienced that. We've watched you be gracious. We've watched you always be faithful to us. And I ask you right now over this house. I ask you to minister in people's lives. Holy Spirit, I ask you to come down and just begin to sovereignly speak. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to talk to you for a minute. I'm not going to hold you much longer, but I want to ask you something. With every head bowed, every eye closed, is there warfare going on in your life? If there is, are you winning or are you losing? Listen, Satan will say, no big deal. I can pick up, I can move on, I can start over. Maybe we'll do this, maybe we'll do that, maybe... Maybe I'll, you know, I'll just go do something else. Listen, that's not the answer. The answer is to trust the Lord. The answer is to stand still and watch God work on your behalf. And I think of how many times through the years I thought, I don't know. I, I can't see any way out of this. I can't see any way this is going to work. And now I look back over just God meeting us over and over and over. Are you in warfare this morning? If you are, I want you to, I want you to raise a hand this morning. If you'd say, Pastor, I, I'm in warfare and, and I, wanna, I want God to meet me here. I want to win this thing. There's people that I want to affect in my life, whether they're your wife, your children, your family, your husband, your ministry. I want to affect, I want all these things to be moved in God's direction because of the victory that I'm going to win. Would you raise a hand up if that's you? Hands. I'm going to ask this. Is there family members? Maybe your family's under attack. Maybe you're not, but your son is, your daughter is, your grandchild is, your grandson, your granddaughter. Maybe there's somebody attached to your life that you'd say, you know, I, I'm good. I, I don't feel like I'm in warfare, but I've got a family member. I've got somebody I love, somebody that's connected to me, that they're fighting for their life. And I'm going to fight alongside of them. I'm here today to win a battle for them. Would you raise a hand if that's you? I'm here, I'm here to war on their behalf. Listen, how many of you, you're in ministry, and I can relate to this. How many times Cindy and I have been warring for this church? We have warred for Ruth's house, warred for Timothy house, warred for the radio, warred for what God had for you. Maybe you're a leader here today and say, Pastor, you know, I'm okay and I don't know anybody in my family that's struggling, but I'm here, I'm warring for my ministry. I'm warring for what God has called me, my family, my husband, my wife, what God has called us to do. Maybe you don't even know what you're called to do yet, but I'm going to tell you something, you can war for it now. You can pull it out of heaven and say, Father, we want to give our life to what you've called us to do. I just don't know of anything more exciting than that. I don't know of anything more exciting than that. I'm going to tell you something. You were made, as a human being, you were made to be given to a purpose. 
you were made for. It is somewhere in you, you were designed by God to live for something bigger than just ourselves. You were designed for it. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't think, do you know, I've said this to you before, do you know they did a study? And they did a study on, on the need for painkillers. And they did a study for people that say were shot in a robbery, in a grocery store or a bank, and men that are shot on the battlefield. And men that are shot on the battlefield have, need half as much morphine as the same man, same age, shot in a grocery store. And this was the conclusion of the study. They said because men in the battlefield are conscious of people needing them. They're conscious of other people looking at them, watching them, even when they're wounded. And I'm telling you, when you have a passion, when you have a, a something that God has put in your life, it changes everything. It changes the way you are. It changes the way you react. It changes the way you live. And maybe today, maybe today, I, I can't see a place in any time in my life. I can't see a time in my and Cindy's life where we will not have some kind of kingdom priority governing our life. It may not be pastoring, but it will be something. Because God has created us for that. If you're here this morning and any of those things, listen, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, you don't know the heavenly David, you don't know, you don't have anybody alongside that can do anything. I mean, people can help to a degree, but so much of this is spiritual and you need the king of kings. You need the giant killer in your life that is Christ. Maybe you're battling with giants emotionally fear and things that just hang on and, and you're wrestling, they're breaking your health down, they're destroying your marriage they're destroying your ability to enjoy life you gotta have the giant killer involved in that, you gotta have Jesus come in Jesus can stop it and if you need that would you raise your hand up, if that's you you need that in your life I want you everybody, everybody that raised a hand I want you to come. Would you come and stand up here? We want to pray for you this morning. Listen, if you're a young couple, maybe you're just beginning life together. Would you say, Pastor, we want to begin to fight for our destiny right now. We want to be begin to war for what God has for us right now. I'm telling you something. I thank God a million times that Cindy and I learned very early on how to fight together how to fight the enemy together, how to fight for our family together, how to war together. Listen, maybe you're warring against finances. You're warring against, maybe you're warring against, you don't even know what you're warring against. There's something that's going on maybe in your family. There's something invisible. There's something keeping you from connection with your spouse. And you want that thing taken out of the way and you're, you're warring against it in the spirit. Come on. Come on. I want to take a minute. Pray over you this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, we just came through a time in this house warring for families, warring for marriages. Still are warring for Ashland. When Ashland first fell off of that cliff and, and nobody knew what the outcome of that was going to be, warring in the spirit. And, and uh, Cindy and I were warring over in when we were uh, gone the weekend, we were gone the weekend this happened. I was up praying and I, I was telling Ashley the other day that God, I believe, gave me a word for her. And I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. We are at war, but we're the victors. We're the victors. Jesus has already won this thing. If you'll stand, if you'll stand, if you'll stand, the victory is assured. It is assured. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, this is something that we're living right now. It's something I'm believing right now. And I want you to raise your hands this morning. Would you do that? Just raise your hands to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we individually, come on, we individually, we give what we're warring against right now. We give it to you. Lord, we give it over to the giant killer that is Jesus. We give it over to the only one that we know can win the battle. Father, we speak right now against the enemy in marriages. 
Father, I take authority over the attack against marriages. People that are thinking ways that are not God. Lord, I pray over a husband's minds, wife's minds, God, that you would begin to silence the enemy. However the enemy is lying, that you would begin to silence them, Lord God. I pray against that wall of unforgiveness. I pray right now for marriages that need miracles. Lord God, we ask right now that you would fish. You would go fishing for a wayward spouse. God, that you would rescue a marriage that is on its way to destruction, God. That you would step in the middle of what the enemy wants to do. God, I speak restoration. I speak restoration, Father. I speak over that mind that they would be able to think right again, God. I rebuke and I take authority over the, the voices of the enemy right now, Lord God. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus, we come against people that are wanting to give up. I come against voices of hopelessness. I come against voices that have said it's gone on too long. This is just who you are. You'll never change. It's always been this way. It's always going to be. That's a lie. That is a lie. Jesus creates all things new. I don't care how long it's been there. I don't care how hard it's been. I don't care how many mistakes you've made. I'm telling you something. Jesus has made us a promise. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'll never walk away. I'll never quit fighting for you. I'll never quit trying to reach you. I'll never quit trying to talk to you. Father, in the name of Jesus. Listen, some of you. Here, listen. Some of you. You know how to war. Now, there's, there's new believers in here. But there's some of you. You know how to war. You've done your share of warring. Your family is together because you know how to war. And I'm asking you right now. I'm asking you to lay your hands on somebody. Look around you. Look around you. And I want you to lay hands. Those of you, you know who I'm talking to. You know who you are. And I'm going to ask you to war for somebody else this morning. I'm going to ask you to war. Come on, do it now. I want you to find somebody around you. You lay hands on somebody and begin to war. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Send up for you. You hear prayer. They send up for their husbands. 
they send up for people that they love. Maybe they're not married yet. But there's somebody they believe has been put in their life. And they're praying for that person to really have an encounter with Jesus. But they need to know that you hear them. That you're hearing them pray. Father, I pray for new families that are just beginning their journey. Lord God, together with each other and with you. And Father, I pray that, Lord God, they learn that, that they learn that their enemy is Satan. It's not each other. That they learn to war against the right enemy. And I just ask this morning, Father, that the that they, that people would just leave here knowing that they don't war by themselves. They war with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords warring on their behalf. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed this morning. Listen.